factory jobs back to America. Look at New Mexico. I think you got more potential to grow quickly than virtually any state in America. Why? Because of where you are, because you have a good highway network, you have good airports, and because there is so much opportunity for new investment here. Now, you can also pay people really good wages if you do modern manufacturing. That's why she won Ohio more than she was supposed to. That's why she won New York more than she was supposed to. Because they are importing good manufacturing jobs, and they know now the big variations in cost in manufacturing are not in labor anymore. They're in energy costs, materials costs, and transportation. So her argument is really simple. Let's look at things that we need here and save the transportation costs and make it in America. And we can make a lot of those things in New Mexico if we have the right kind of investments. And the fourth thing we need to do is to recognize, I don't care what anybody else says in this primary or anywhere else, the Dodd-Frank bill that President Obama signed will keep Wall Street from ever wrecking Main Street again. All you got to do is enforce it. The problem is, too many banks think those rules apply to making small business loans and home mortgage loans to working people, and the law requires, the law that I enforced a lot when I was president, that every bank that has an ATM machine in any community in America has to consider people who live there for loans. We've got to get small businesses going in this country again. That's two-thirds of our new job and has been for 20 years. And the fifth thing that's a big deal for New Mexico is that we, she wants to invest more money in science and technology in practical ways that create jobs. Now, look, you've got Sandia and Los Alamos. Both were born in the nuclear age. There is still some work to be done maintaining our nuclear capacity, maintaining the safety of it, making sure we can do that without any nuclear testing because we don't want to do that again and we're trying to get everybody in the world to give that up. But there are other things that that brain power can produce. These labs should be repurposed for a 21st century economy. That will help our national security. Clean energy, nanotechnology, other new technologies that will generate opportunities for people to have work in. There's already a proposal for repurposing Sandia involving the University of New Mexico, University of Texas, Texas A&M, and two big companies. We can do this in a way that would embrace the whole New Mexico economy. There aren't that many people living here. New Mexico State should be involved. Every institution of higher education should be involved in a way that we have to do. And don't be skeptical about this. I've seen this. I was telling some folks before I came in here, the third biggest university in one place in America, not with multiple campuses, you won't surprise you, the two biggest are Ohio State and Michigan. Third biggest, Central, the University of Central Florida in Orlando. Most of you know Orlando as Disney World, right? Or the Universal Entertainment Park. But it's also the home of the video game division of global entertainment arts. And the Defense Department, the Space Agency, NASA, and these three groups spend counted five billion dollars a year investing there in computer simulation. Why? Because if you want the same family to keep coming back to Disney World, you have to keep making it interesting, right? You have to keep improving the computer simulation. And because it's a lot cheaper to teach somebody to go up in a spaceship, fly a jet airplane, or drive a tank on a simulator than the real deal. It's also a lot safer. So they need constant improvements. So the University of Central Florida said, I think we'll be the best in the world at that. And let me just tell you, there is a law that's been on the books since 1980 that says if a university in New Mexico gets any money from the federal government for research, if they come up with any idea that has commercial value, they can sell it. 
or they can take a piece of a new company, they can do whatever, but if they make money, they can keep all the money as long as they reinvest it in the community and in the university to educate more people and generate more economic opportunity. There are now 100 computer simulation companies in Orlando. It is no longer just Disney World, it's the computer, uh, uh, computer simulation capital of the universe. Why? Because they use their university to match their potential to generate opportunity for young people and not so young people. You can do this everywhere. Look at New Mexico. Go home and take out a map of your state. Look at it. Where are the people? And look at the, the where all the Native Americans live. Why aren't they all making a killing having free electricity with their own solar panels and selling solar and wind energy to everybody else and diversifying their economy? They had affordable broadband, they could. And this is the thing. So, first, she got the best ideas. Secondly, she knows you can't activate those ideas unless everybody can participate. Which first means you have to make college affordable and the debt manageable. And she got a plan for free community college tuition, free tuition at public colleges and other small private colleges for everybody who needs it, and debt-free graduation for everybody. That's better. And it's better than, I believe, in all respect, her opponent's proposal for free tuition in all public schools because that requires the states to match a third of it, and I don't think those states can afford to match. This you can do just for the federal budget. Then to repay the debt, how many people know somebody with college debt here? You look around. This is paralyzing young Americans, and a lot of their parents. I can't tell you how many young Americans can't even move out of their parents' house because they can't make a rent payment and the debt payment. I can't tell you how many young Americans might like to start their own small business and couldn't possibly get a loan from the bank because their credit's underwater because of the debt payment. So here's what she proposes. She wants to give everybody in America two options. The average college debt is $26,000. But for people who graduate from medical school, their average is about 200. The highest I've heard of is 400, where a person got punished for continually, after graduating from medical school, doing public service related health care, so the doctor could never earn enough money to keep the debt payments going. And the interest rates kept going up. So she wants to give everybody two options. First of all, if you just want to get rid of it, if you do two years in an AmeriCorps program and one year of any kind of public service, even if you're a teacher, say, you work in a drug plant, if you're a firefighter, you're a police officer, anything like that, in addition to the pay, you get $23,500 tax-free to throw it against the debt and say goodbye. Now, if you cannot do that or you don't want to do it, she would give everybody another option to treat your college loan like a home mortgage. Now think about it. Everybody in this audience under 30 years old has a legitimate chance to live to be 100. And if we keep going with our medical progress, you have a legitimate chance to live to be 100 and know exactly what you're doing on your last day on Earth. That is, we will lift the specter of Alzheimer's from future generations. Now, if that happens, your college education is worth more than a home as a lifetime asset. So here's her proposal. First, change the current law which makes a college loan the only loan in America you cannot refinance. That's insane. If everybody refinanced their loan tomorrow, 25 million Americans would save an average of more than $2,000 each, and the ones that owed more would save more. Second, Give everybody the option of paying the loan back over 20 years at a fixed percentage of your monthly income it would go up if you owed more, but it could never be more than 10% of your after-tax income. Never. And if you don't pay it off after 20 years, the rest is forgiven. Now think what that 
Trump would do? Everybody could move out of their parents' house. If you had a job you wanted to take, but it paid less than the one you have, you could take it now because your loan payment would go down. If you always dreamed of owning a coffee shop, a, a little bookstore, an organic bakery, you name it, any kind of small business, you could get the loan now because what you owe is just a fixed amount. And if, like a lot of small businesses, you didn't make any money the first year or two, it wouldn't matter because you wouldn't owe anything on the debt. This would liberate millions of Americans so we could all rise together. This is very, very important. But what about others? Same thing is true of immigration reform, by the way. You got 11 and a half million undocumented people here that are either in school or working. And they live with more than 5 million of your fellow Americans who wake up every day worrying about what's going to happen to the kids or whether the adults are going to be separated from the kids. We need to just fix this. Look, there hasn't been any net in migration from Mexico since 2010. They didn't need a wall for that. All they needed was to build their own economy. And that's what they've been doing. So that's important. Then there are populations that have to be addressed. Let's start with the veterans. Veterans, veterans have access to education and training, but the unemployment rate for returning veterans is still higher than the population as a whole, even though the skill levels are greater. Part of that is we don't have still the kind of continuing support we need from veterans who are good in the workforce but still occasionally suffer from post-traumatic stress syndrome. They need to have that support so they can go to work, support themselves, and know that we appreciate what they do. Second, the good news about battlefield medicine is that more people are surviving than ever before. The bad news is a lot of people are coming home with severe physical impairments. And a lot of them still don't have the support they need to deal with traumatic brain injury and a lot of other physical problems that they could live and do things with if they did. Hillary was on the Armed Services Committee during 9-11. She wasn't just Secretary of State when we got Ben Laden. She was on the Armed Services Committee, the first New York Senator ever to sit on it for eight years. She has spent amazing amounts of time on these issues. And she knows that we will not be whole again until the men and women who come home from their military service have adequate health care, including mental as well as physical health, and adequate support for reintegration. Second, we can't go on being one of only seven countries in the world that gives no paid leave. Only seven countries. That's why we're not in the top ten anymore in the percentage of women in the workforce. That's why she is for paid leave, equal pay, and affordable childcare. So we can do that. Third, the same thing is true for veterans of disabled Americans in general. The fastest growing, listen to this, the fastest growing consumer group in America are people with disabilities. But you cannot consume if you don't have any money to consume with. And in spite of the fact that people with disabilities have an almost flawless attendance rate record and a very high productivity record in all jobs for which they are qualified, we are not being aggressive enough to make sure that everybody has a chance to get into the workforce. Hillary will do that. That's important. And take all these populations. Just one more. There's still too many young people in prison for nonviolent offenses that ought to be out here in the workforce. Just think, it cost Americans an average of $64,000 to keep somebody in the penitentiary. How many kids can you educate in the Los Cruces school system for $64,000? By the way, her education program is good. She thinks we ought to spend limited federal dollars on 
Not quite so much testing and rulemaking and more on helping teachers be better teachers, principals be better principals, schools be the culture of the kids and educators. And look, you can't just open the prison doors to people who've been kept in prison. You've got to get them education, training, job placement, and they can't be discriminated against when they apply for a job. We need these young people back making America stronger so we can all rise together. Now, if you do the right things with investment and the private economy starts growing again too, and you get all the people back where they can participate and can possibly participate, then we still have to live together and govern together. One of the reasons it's so important, especially now that the Republican nominee has given us a list of his proposed Supreme Court nominee, whoa, is that we not have a right-wing Republican president, a right-wing Republican Congress, and an ideological Supreme Court. We need a Supreme Court that will protect and expand voting rights, not restrict them, protect and expand labor rights, not restrict them, protect and expand women's rights, their rights, and everybody else's rights. If you really believe we can go together, we have to go together. We've got to live together. So that's my case for her. She's got the right values, the right vision, and the right the policies. But you also have to realize that the two things that can keep all these good intentions from coming to bear are continued gridlock in Washington and troubles around the world. And so, you ought to pick the person who's actually done something about this. When Hillary was first lady, she spearheaded with Senator Kennedy the Children's Health Insurance Program, a lot of others. They are now, it's a big part of Obamacare. There are 8.4 million kids in America with this health insurance. 76% of the Congress voted for it. She always finds a way to convince people to come together. When we were facing a national crisis, and children aging out of foster care, she went not to a Democrat, but to the House Republican leader who thought he disagreed with us on everything, but she knew he had adopted children. And she said, I know you don't believe in government, but let me tell you something. These kids are just like your kids, except nobody adopts them. Now people are afraid to adopt non-infant children. And they're afraid to adopt kids with special needs because they don't think they can afford to support them. So you're a Republican, let's give them a big tax credit for doing it. If they adopt non-infant kids, a bigger one. If they adopt kids with special needs and give them the support they need to help. And the kids that are gonna age out anyway, you cannot throw them on the street. They need job training, they need access to education, they need a living allowance. We don't want people to go on the street. Okay. All I had to do was sign the bill, there was an 80 increase in the adoption of children out of foster care because she always finds a way to make something go happen. And then she becomes a senator from New York and she works with Senator John McCain on making sure we take care of returning veterans with traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress syndrome and worked with Senator Lindsey Graham to make sure that guardsmen and reservists from New Mexico when they come home get the same health care regular veterans do. And there's no disparity because there was no disparity whenever they were getting shot at. And dodging roadside bombs. And she works with Republicans in New York, small manufacturers and small farmers, because nobody ever tried to help them. And when the Republican head of the Farm Bureau on Long Island, one of our more challenging areas for a Democrat, endorsed him for re-election, the press said, Joe, I thought you were a Republican. He said, I thought I was too. <laughs> How can you endorse her? He said, look, all these politicians sound great at election time. All I know is I've been trying to help these little farmers hang on to their land a long time, and she has actually done things to help them. I am for her, and he is still for her to this day. So, she becomes Secretary of State. And this is where the third point comes in. 
You need somebody who knows enough, is responsible enough, and is respected enough to keep us safe and give us the space to grow. And if we set the right example, we can help move the rest of the world from a lot of these tensions. Just remember, I spent a lifetime doing this. Whenever people are working together, good things happen. Whenever they fight all the time, good things don't happen. So sometimes what is good politics is bad for your living arrangements. And she got the sanctions on Iran to try to stop their nuclear program. Got China and Russia to go along. Republicans like that. She got the New START Treaty ratified in the Senate, which is the only thing that survived our attempt to get along with Mr. Putin. It makes nuclear exchanges with Russia much less likely. And it's required 67 votes in the U.S. Senate. That's a lot of Republicans. She got them. And she flew overnight from Asia to go to Egypt when the Muslim Brotherhood president was there, and together they agreed on a plan that stopped the shooting war between Israel and Hamas and Gaza. Republicans liked that a lot. But she also tripled the number of lives we were saving of children, mostly in Africa, who had AIDS simply by going to generic drugs. And that's what we ought to do in America. We need to drive down the cost of prescription drugs in America like she did over city. But when Hillary left office, the approval of the United States was 20 points higher than it was the day she took office as Secretary of State. There's a reason for that. She always makes something good happen. And people know she's on the level. One day a young military officer came up to me in the Congress. I was there after I left the White House testifying on a public health issue. And this young guy came up and introduced himself and he said, you don't know me, Mr. President, but I represent the Pentagon in Congress. And uh, as you know, your wife's on the Armed Services Committee. I just thought you might like to know that over there we think she knows more and cares more about our issues and our people than anybody else in the Congress and either party. And she said, he said, I know she doesn't agree with us on everything, but not one time, not even once, has she ever taken a cheap shot? Has she ever done anything just to get a headline to follow? She just always on the level. Now, so that brings me to the final point. If uh, all this is true, why do all these surveys say people have reservations about her? Because it's all true. Keep in mind, if everybody believed in government, the Republican Party would be out of business today. Right? That's their whole argument. The government would mess up the two-car parade. If everybody believed in the integrity and impact of public service, that would be so boring, what would the political press do? I mean, you're laughing, but let me take you back in time. I've always liked Ross Cruz since I first came here in the 80s to help inaugurate to help inaugurate a new president at New Mexico State who had been the chancellor at the University of Arkansas. Then I came back in 96. I was the first president since William Howard Taft to come to Las Cruces. But when I ran for president in 1992, American people didn't know me, and I had, well, I was the longest serving governor in America. I knew the White House very well, and I liked, as everybody knows, the first President Bush, we became very close friends, but I liked him back then. But I got a call from this White House saying, we've looked at these surveys, they're the only one who can win. I said, what are you talking about? President Bush is in the mid-70s in approval, and I'm running fifth out of six people in the polls. He said, yeah, I know, but you're different, you've actually done something. You've been a governor, and he said, so we have no choice. We're going to take you out, and we're going to do it early. And the press will believe anything we tell them about Arkansas. We'll create a presumption that you're the story, and you have to go. So when I won in this week, 
24 years ago in California and New Jersey. I was running third in the poll. I got a beautiful headline from one of the San Francisco newspapers saying that Bush and Perot walked in tight race, Clinton on a factory. I got a map that showed I was going to get nine electoral votes. What happened? When people practice the politics of personal destruction, it works until it doesn't. And once people start thinking about who's going to be the president, who's going to make these decisions, who spent a lifetime serving other people? What's the real score? With tax returns, Clinton 30, Trump zero. What's the real story? With emails, Clinton 30,000, all other secretaries of state zero. People will start adding and thinking, and oh my God, they will realize that they have a chance that they have never had, not just to elect the first woman president, but to elect someone who has only been an elected official or an appointed official for 12 years, but has spent more than 40 years making good things happen for other people. And we need that. Somebody who went out of office, just woke up every day saying, wonder what we can do about this problem. Now look, all over the world, you've got stagnant economies, declining middle class incomes, rising inequality, and declining upward mobility. If you want declining inequality and rising upward mobility, if you want us to grow together, if you want us to live together, if you want somebody who knows that national security is, yes, a tough defense, yes, a smart diplomacy, but it still bridges, not walls, you got one choice here. And you got... And so, I speak to you not just as somebody who's had the job and knows something about it, but as somebody... You can, you should maybe discount a little of what I say about Hillary, but you also ought to credit it. I would never knowingly put my country at risk. I love this country. I love this country. And I am telling you, I was well qualified to be president in 1992 because I knew what we needed to do. But there is nobody in America man or woman, as well qualified to be president at this moment when we go to